Creation Clues, Episode 2, Irreducible Complexity. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and a hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That's designed. You know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. Darwinism was a lot more plausible when we were thinking about globs of protoplasm than it is when we're thinking about molecular machines. Scientists in Darwin's day were hopeful that the complexity of biology would resolve to simplicity once they found the basis of life. But we found out the exact opposite. And in the 20th century, we found out that the lower you go from whole animal to organ to, to tissues and cells, the more complex life becomes, and that the very basis of life, the, the cell, is just outrageously complex. And so the 19th century hope that life at the bottom would be a, a simple phenomenon is spectacularly wrong. sperm is in fact a cell, the function of which is to convey the genetic data of the male to the egg cell in the woman's body. When it is examined closely, sperm looks just like a machine specially designed to carry this load. The front of the sperm is covered with armor. There is another layer of armor under the first, and under this second layer lies the cargo carried by the sperm. In this cargo are 23 chromosomes belonging to the male. All the information concerning the human body, right down to the finest detail, is carried inside the chromosomes. In order for a new human being to emerge, the 23 chromosomes in the sperm have to unite with the 23 chromosomes inside the mother's egg cell. In this way, the first foundations of a person's 46 chromosomes will be laid. The armor system at the head of the sperm 
will protect this valuable cargo from all danger right through its journey. But the design in sperm is not limited to this. There is a very powerful engine in the middle of the sperm. The end of the engine is connected to the tail of the sperm. The power produced by the engine turns the tail like a propeller and enables the sperm to move swiftly. Since there is an engine in the middle, it will need fuel to make it work. This need has been thought of and the most productive fuel for the engine, fructose, has been placed in the liquid surrounding the sperm. In this way, the fuel for the engine is provided throughout the length of the journey it will undertake. Thanks to this perfect design, the sperms head rapidly straight for the XL. When the length of the sperm and the distance traveled are considered, it emerges that this is relatively as fast as a speedboat. The production of these miraculous engines is carried out in a most expert manner. Inside each of the testicles, the sperm production centers, there are microscopic tubes of a total distance of around 500 meters long. The production inside these tiny tubes works just like the conveyor belt assembly system inside a modern factory. The sperm's armor, engine, and tail parts are assembled onto one another in turn. What emerges as a result is a real wonder of engineering. We have to think a little in the face of this reality. How do these unconscious cells know how to prepare the sperms in the appropriate form, despite the fact that they know nothing about the mother's body? How have they learned to make the armor, engine, and tail that the sperm will need in the mother's body? With what intelligence do they assemble these components in the correct order? How do they know that the sperm will need fructose? How have they learned to build an engine that runs on fructose? There is but one answer to all of these questions. The sperms and the seminal fluid that they are placed in were specifically created by God for the continuation of the human race.